You're listening to Two Girls, One Crossword. Um, Lindsay Lohan is back. She's back and more beautiful than literally ever. She looks great. I'm really happy for her because mm -hmm. obviously she went through a bunch with, you know, the paparazzi. And I, I read this book called, I think it's called Girls Can Kiss Now. It's like a like short story collection written mm -hmm. by this a gay millennial but she talks about like i didn't realize how horrible it was M remember when Lindsay lohan was dating that female dj yes in like the paparazzi that people were like horrible to her yes. about it yes and then you know it just like spiraled from there and then she had all these like issues with paparazzi and, and drinking right. and then she moved to dubai where yes there's like no paparazzi like i think a lot of celebrities move there because you're not or paparazzi aren't allowed mm-hmm um, and she's been living there, you know, for a while, but now she's back acting and looks great. She looked great. And it, they had little, oh, by the way, we're talking about the, the <laughs> new Netflix Christmas movie, Falling for Christmas. Yes. Starring Lindsay Lohan. Of course. And, um. With her big, beautiful hair. Yeah. Her hair is really amazing. But some of it's probably fake, you think. It has to be. Well, she's got the money for it and she deserves it. That's all I got to say. If, yeah. I had, if I had the money for hair like that, you better believe I would I would have hair like that. Just, just, I love to see yeah. a redhead in red because yes. I feel like sometimes they don't do it. Because look, in all these made-for-TV Christmas movies, you're either wearing red or green. Yes. But you typically wear the same one like the whole movie. So mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. chose to do red for her, like mm -hmm. red, pinks and stuff mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. And Anyways, uh, the movie was, like, very entertaining. Mm -hmm. Knocked <laughs> and... it out of the park. Perfect Christmas movie. And she was good in it. And then mm -hmm. in the little blooper, she looked like she was having fun. So yeah. I'm happy for her. Yes, I'm also happy for her. And I, lo I love a good Christmas movie. Um, they just soothe the soul. I feel like there's another one that I have on my list that we, we should watch. Um, like another, you know, t made for TV one. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. listeners, if you have like a particularly good made for TV one, let us know. Hit us up. We will watch it. We're always looking for a good made for TV, made for TV Christmas film. I cannot bring myself to watch the um, royal baby one, a Christmas prince, the royal baby. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did that come out this year? I thought they came out last year. Last year? I, okay. I'd seen I don't the think other I watched two. that one either. I don't I, like when they throw a baby into the mix. Like, let's, We just don't need three. Let's just keep no. it at what it is. That, I, have, I think we've, we actually have talked. Did we talk about that one on my very first podcast? No. The Made for TV Christmas movie podcast. But I had issues with that movie because it was like, it was modern, but the way it was written was just so old school. Like, the yeah. outfits were horrible. It was bad. She wears, like, Converse to the wedding. And it's like, that's been done. We get it. Like, Converse in a fancy on. dress. You're edgy. Next. You're not like the other girls. Let's, exactly. Let's spice it up. No, the one we saw was um, the one with Vanessa Hudgens. And oh, we've Princess seen... Switch. Yeah, we've seen all of those. The last time, it was, like, the evil cousin. Oh, yeah. Cousin. Switch 3. <laughs> I don't think they're doing Van it this year. Vanessa Hudgens plays three versions of herself. Just a regular girl, Baker from Chicago, of course. Then a, like, princess about to become queen of some random European country. And then the queen's almost I well, identical cousin. I yeah. <laughs> and so oh. they're all switching places back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Hijinks ensue. It's great. And all Christmas themed, of course. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's us. That's uh, what are we doing again? Oh, yeah. Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Our podcast, Two Girls, Ooh. One Crossword. Yeah. Your favorite weekly Podword Crosscast. Yeah, but back we're again. Doing out of order. Yeah, out of, out of order a little bit. Uh, I'm Chelsea Rowan. And I'm Grace Chapinka. Back again for another week. Thank you for bearing with us while we took a week off to celebrate giving of having thanks. two days off <laughs> yes exactly i i've already made plans next year i'm taking the whole week off are you kidding me are you effing kidding me well next year is my father's 60th birthday and he's already mm -hmm. he's already claimed my thanksgiving so we will be going on some sort of trip uh, and he asked me like the couple you know he has some ideas of, like where he wants to go blah 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 and like we were talking about them you know savannah or new santa fe or palm springs or there's this place called jackson hole in wisconsin which is like a kind of skiing type place 
And we were talking about all of them. And just as I was about to sign off with him off of FaceTime, he goes, well, what do you think about Florida? And I'm like, no. He's like, well, I wasn't hey, talking. I wasn't talking watch about. Watch your mouth about Florida. <laughs> no, no, okay. no. Well, so here's, there's, uh, there's three elements to my saying no to Florida. One, I'll be in Florida next year anyway. I'm mm-hmm. not doing Florida twice in a year. That's number one. Number two is he was asking, because I can guarantee you he wants to go to Disney. I will not do mm-hmm. Disney. And three, my dad goes to Disney at least twice a year, plus he vacations in various coastal Floridian towns. And to that, I say, Richard, just do something different for once in your goddamn life for your 60th birthday. Let's go somewhere else. He's a Disney adult, and you just have to accept that. No. <laughs> Um, anyway, shall we get into our poll of Palooza from last week? Let's do it. This was based off of Chelsea's Ina Garten topic, but we asked our Twitter followers, what's your favorite type of cooking show? Options mm. were baking, competition, even though baking is competition, but I feel like it's different. It's different. Um, inform- <clears throat> informative, like Ooh. Barefoot Contessa, and then none. <gasps> and um, 44% top vote or the you know the top choice 44 percent was for baking <gasps> wow yeah um in second place with 23 percent of the vote was none that was me oh, um in third God. place with 22 percent of the vote so trailing very slightly behind was informative shows and then last place 11 percent was competition so food network I'm, take note <laughs> yeah i guess people aren't into chopped anymore like they used to be chopped is insane anymore i wouldn't consider it a cooking show at all so much as a I spectacle like, well because they keep having to up the like all these competitions even um great british bake-off is which yes. i watch against my will by the way but it's kind <laughs> of like going through that too where it's like they're running out of things to make it interesting so uh-huh. then you know like they had everyone knows they had the made make mexican food on a baking show uh-huh. and they were making like as they say tacos and guacamole it was horrible and pico de gallo yeah bad news bears it's like i think this is what refried beans look like and it's literally like beans and water yeah it's it was yeah i haven't seen that episode but from what i've I've seen seen online yeah yeah um yeah and unfortunately one of the beauties of great british bake-off and i think that's why a lot of people clicked baking on the poll is that it lacks that competitive element that a lot of American cooking shows have. It's just like mm-hmm. a feel-good show where you get to see cute people making cute things, like, honestly. But it's it's edging on gimmicky now. There was a couple mm-hmm. seasons ago um, where they had them make um, naan, which is totally fine. But I've never seen them do anything like this before, and they haven't done anything like this since, or correct me if I'm wrong. Every single cooking every single bake was done in the tent except for the naan where they made them go outside and they each had to start their own fire keep the fire lit and then bake oh the God. naan over the fire and I'm i'd like, be so pissed if i went home on that i'm like what does this have to do with me being able to bake well i found that i thought that that was really frustrating because i think that was for the final and the leader the person i thought should have won didn't win because they didn't do too well in the outdoor survival, oh non God. technical. And I'm like, come on. Anyway. And like, what are the implications of doing like, you know, a foreign dish and then making them have to make it like outside in the fire? I, it's like, mm. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. there's a lot. There's lots going on there. Uh, I picked informative because I love I love Barefoot Contessa, but I also love Chef's Table. I was going to tell you, I went to a Friendsgiving and I made Ina Garten's like garlic roasted potatoes. <gasps> so I did. And yeah, she makes it look so easy in her little thing. She goes fast. I mean, she, she went fast she's in those whipping. Things. Yeah. And but then how they taste. They were good. And then what's his face came in and they were like, kissing. did you see Jeffrey? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and all the comments were like, it was so great when her husband came in. I'm like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this is fine. But sometimes, sometimes I just want to, I like the TikTok recipes because it's like, Mm-hmm. I don't need to, it to be interpersonal, but I understand the people like that. She's on TikTok and Instagram now, so. Oh, well then. Maybe. Now, the more you know. Um, I have a very, very minor corrections corner. Tell me. Okay. So, 
as all of our listeners know, and if you don't know, listen to our old episodes, you Rubicon. Um, <laughs> our uh, we were graciously invited to Learned League, which we talked a little bit about when we graced it her men's episode. And I think one of us made a comment that the the person <laughs> who invited. <laughs> made someone made a i can't remember but it very well could have been you it also sounds like something i would have said um that the person who invited us to learned league one of our listeners thank you so much for inviting us yet again um did it for their own ego and they did not they just thought we would have fun oh oh, because i said that they (laughs) were inviting us to make them look better yeah yeah (laughs) because they need to get they need to get some like lower tier people there to make them feel smarter yeah that's what we meant to that yeah but yeah, no, we know that meant. you, you know that we, he, he knows that we would enjoy it if we were to join and I'm on the wait list now, not to like brag, but I'm, uh, I'm learned and I'm wait, going to be the What does the wait list mean? Like then they're going to look into our stuff and be like, this person's an idiot. They don't get in. <laughs> I don't think that, I think it's just, um, so people will drop out of the league and then they filter people in from the wait list. That's it. Okay. Oh, oh, there's like. Only some spots, I see. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Well, we'll see. I, I didn't realize. I thought we were just in, so I, I know you texted me today. I have to, like, be part of this wait. I have to get on the wait list now. Yeah, to get on the wait list. Anyway, that's my corrections corner. Shall we go into hits and shits? Actually, I have hits some news. Shit. Should we start with the news first? Oh, yes. The sad okay. news. There's, so we'll start with the sad news, and then we'll get into the better stuff. So in shit news, the biggest shit I think I've taken all year is the news that the Washington Post is unfortunately shutting down their Sunday magazine. And you might be thinking, what's this got to do with us? What's it got to do with crosswords? Well, you guys know how obsessed we are with Evan Bernholz's Sunday Washington Post crosswords. And unfortunately, his Sunday puzzles are part of the uh, Sunday magazine from the Washington Post, which they are now shutting down. And it's seeming like information is sparse right now. I'm just kind of giving Mm -hmm. you information that I found on Evan's Twitter that uh, Evans puzzles will be folded into the the actual publication, the newspaper Washington Post. So his puzzles will be released on Sundays through that. And I don't believe we'll be able to play online anymore, though no. if you have a subscription, you should be able to download the PDF. <gasps> oh, Evan. Well, maybe I will have to get a subscription. Just for Evan at the very least. I mean, yeah. What are, what's a girl to do? Your two biggest fans, your fan club, we don't have anything to do anymore. Maybe Evan just sends us a copy of his puzzles every week. <laughs> <laughs> Under the table. Well, if Evan set up a Patreon, uh, just let me know. We'll, we'll do a subscription. Yeah, we would be. Yeah, I mean, I feel like his puzzles are great. Every puzzle, like, of his every Sunday. Literally. Always really fun to do. I love, like, the level of difficulty it is because it's, like, challenging but not impossible. Right. It's really big, and he does, like, really cool themes and stuff. So, yeah, exactly. he had a Patreon. The thing is, I need to be able to do it on my iPad. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> is like that's if I can access singular it requirement. <laughs> on that's why it's like I feel like I don't do the independent puzzles as much anymore because yeah, I know I can get them on Crosslight, but I love going into my little app and just doing it there. I know Crosslight. I feel like some there needs to be some developer out there that gives it some TLC because it really needs some TLC. I do not like a Crosslight at all as an app. No, or offense. there needs to be like an independent like. Because aggregate you, or you something. You have to like download it and then open it in a cross light. Yeah. There should be one app where you can access different independent crosswords. If you guys need any someone capital behind that. that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not certainly your girl. can't, but someone else but, can do um, But okay, moving away from shit news, I'm going to give you some, I don't know, positive news. Well, there was um, Boswords is a crossword tournament league. They just mm-hmm. completed their league. Uh, and um, so... Boswords competes like a couple times a year as like crossword leagues uh, and they competed for 10 weeks. They have been competing for 10 weeks since the end of September and their championship was held on the 28th of November and they have different like you can uh, participate as individual or pairs, so on and so forth. And then they have different like levels of difficulty. I believe the most difficult level is called stormy and so i just want to (laughs) shout out the top three like the first second and third prize from the individual stormy league um we've heard these names many many Mm. times these are the names that sweep at all the crossword tournaments but you know just a congrats as always and and uh and just a general question of when are you going to step down and let others take your place first place was eric agard uh none other 
Number two was Will Nettiger. Shout out to Will. And three, Tyler Hinman. Of course, these are the three that are always topping the list. So good for you. And congratulations, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Must be nice to be a genius. Yes. Um, I am. I'm happy for people who are good at stuff. Am I she jealous? Is. Sure. <laughs> she can be happy and jealous. They're not like mutually exclusive. Sometimes, I mean, I have some talents, but I really feel like <laughs> there are some people who are like so good at, at or like really, really good at stuff. You're, you have a lot of or talents. Good. Thank you. But I really feel like if I'm in a talent show, I barely have anything. I guess you can't really do a crossword in a talent show. But you also, I was just thinking, like, you're really good at crocheting, but I think that at a talent show I'm, would be probably the most boring talent I'm also ever. not really good at crocheting. I'm, like, moderate at, you know. Oh, well, I think she's very good. So, I mean, at my... Thanks. Yeah. Every, everyone, Chelsea's crocheting now. And... Thanks she's to Grace's been made, to She's switch. made so much stuff already. I mean, she's, like, zooming through. It's amazing. It scratches the part of my brain that I need scratched, like, constantly. I now, think about it all the time. I did that knitting episode. I wonder if we'll have a um, <gasps> a crochet, crochet topic. Yeah, I think crochet is a bit newer than knitting, so there's mm. not as... But actually, I'm not sure. I could be making that up. Somebody put um, crocheting in a puzzle, and then we'll do it. Thank you yeah. very much. Thanks. Thanks. Shall we get into our heights and shites? Our I actually don't have that many. Heights. This... Yes. Um, oh, yeah. Sorry. We already did shites, but our puzzle heights and shites. Yes. Um, I don't have that many. I feel like I didn't do that many puzzles because I was off my game because of Thanksgiving break and da da da. You don't need to explain yourself. Just tell tell us what you did like. <sighs> okay, I liked the Monday, November twenty eighth, New Yorker by Brooke Husick. Um, fifteen across type of establishment of which fewer than twenty five remain in the U S. Lesbian bar. The lesbian bar. I was, I was gonna wondering. do that as my topic, but. Mm. I didn't. Um, 20 across options for peach and toad. And the answer was carts. Cute. I, who, what's your Mario, Mario Kart character? It's Belinda or whatever. You like her, right? Yeah. I she like floats. I, I always have to, I always have to play peach because Daisy's never unlocked, but I prefer Daisy. Mm -hmm. She's like got the brownish red hair and the yellow dress. I like her a lot. That's who we were. I think her name's Belinda. I actually don't know. I don't play that much Mario, but when we play that one puzzle game. <laughs> we should play that again, by the way. We had a lot of fun playing the rowing the boat game. We still, we have to finish uh, Stray. Oh, we're almost done. We're almost done. All right. Um, okay. And then. Oh, six, six down. Museum of blank. Boston attraction with a collection of poor traits. And it's the Museum of Bad Art. Oh. Um, and I looked this up. This is like recently reopened. It's always been like around Boston or in Massachusetts, mm. but recently reopened in Boston. And it's literally a museum of bad art. And I was potentially going to do a topic on it, but I ended up choosing something else. Um, but I thought it was funny that they do have like a calendar they release every year. So <laughs> if you're interested, but since that's hilarious Alex is from Boston and we go there, you like, should go often. I'm like, yeah, that maybe that'll be our next little oh my God. field trip while we're there. Um, nine down, feet picks say question mark. Not and the answer free. was tats. <laughs> like oh. tattoos. Yeah. Amazing. Um 26 down, three-eyed alien from the Pizza Planet claw machine, for example. Squeaky toy. Squeaky toy, nice. And that was it from that puzzle there. Okay. Liked. I'm going to start with the Saturday, November 26th, New York Times by Kanyin Ajayi. Uh, I really liked One Across. Influential booksellers? Question mark. And the answer is blurbs. And I was like, wait a second, huh? And then I was like, oh, blurbs influence you mm -hmm. to buy books. I was like, wow, it's a good opener. Anyway, um, also blurb is also just a fun word. A blurb, exactly. It's like the. It makes me think of that girl, um, the Goosebump book girl. Oh, my God. Oh, my Back. God. Goosebumps. Yes. I actually saw... Oh, my God. We're so tangential. But I saw a TikTok about her origin story, about how that happened. And it was a parody pic that she took. It wasn't, like, real. And... I feel like I, I had read that, too. Yeah. And she was, like... The lies come crushing down. It happened when she was in high school. And then she went on, like, a trip, like, a backpacking trip across Europe, like, in college. And when she got home, it had exploded. Like, some guy <laughs> had posted... I don't know. Wild. <laughs> Amazing. Um, also from i just i love this puzzle for so many reasons would recommend it but uh 16 across john reese novel that's a response to jane Eyre, 
which is funny because I just saw a TikTok about this. And the answer is Wide Sargasso Sea. And if you haven't read Wide Sargasso Sea, you're missing out. It is a retelling of Jane Eyre from the point of view of the wife in the attic. Right. Um, uh, it's amazing. And she is um, from Jamaica originally. And so it's like, it's Caribbean literature, essentially. And it kind of tells it from a POC point of view. Um, and it really like turns Jane Eyre in its head. Um, and then I read that in like a when I was in college, but in, in the same class that I read this novel, I read another novel that appears in the same exact puzzle, 56 Across, Chinua Achibi novel. That's a response to Heart of Darkness. Things Fall Apart. Things Fall Apart. I think a lot of people have read Things <laughs> Fall Apart, right? But I had yeah. never, I didn't know it was in response to Heart of Darkness. I or if I either. did, I had forgotten. Anyway, so I learned something new, or maybe I was reminded of something I had previously known. Um, I liked that. And then I liked 36 Across, Open Many Tabs, maybe. And the answer was Bartend. Um, nice. And this is for you. And Failingly Loyal. And the answer is Ride or Die. That's me. That's 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 for our... the most part. I do draw lines, like obviously. <laughs> I think everybody Murder. has to have a everybody yeah. has to have a boundary. Yes, for sure. But I would be like, why do you want to murder? You know, right, right. I'd hear you out. Right, right. I would never condone it. But I would she, hear you she, out. she's not like a full on rider die. She's more of like a full on rider. Let's go through the McDonald's yeah. drive through instead. <laughs> Talk me off a ledge. I'm, yes, type. I'm the type of friend that if you're like, should we get a treat? I'm well, almost always say yes. <laughs> And that's that's the kind of friend you need. Uh, that's what I have from that puzzle. Did you do the Tuesday, November 29th, New Yorker by Wine Lou? I did. I just did that moments before this call f- when we were eating dinner. Um, I had a few that I liked. 30 across, place that lacks spirit, question mark. And the answer was dry state. Okay, yes. that's Obviously, that's the answer we put in as well, but... Are there full-on states that are dry? I don't know. That's the only question that Matt and I had, and we never ended up looking it up. But let I us know, like, listeners. N- yeah, I'm not sure. I would think like U- Utah would be like the only one. That's that the only one. A dry I state, of. but I doubt they would have any liquor, or right. it's like hard to get. Right. Um, Fifty-five across. May kittens appear here? Question mark. Cat calendar. It was that tripped Matt and I up for so long. <laughs> it's really good though um oh wait sorry that's the other ones i had from that one that's okay i am going to take us back a little bit to the friday uh, november 18th new yorker by paolo pasco this mm-hmm. is like before thanks the week before thanksgiving anyway we didn't talk about this because of the thanksgiving hiatus we took but uh, i liked the theme the theme was called elemental change and the revealer was 59 across purported counterbalance for greenhouse gas emissions or a description of the wordplay in 1827, 39, and 51 across. The answer is carbon offset. And so essentially, each of the themed answers are related to their clue, but if you offset the C, the letter C, which is carbon, mm-hmm. um, you get a like a common phrase, uh, essentially. So I'll just give you an example. 18 across. Quote, consuming pop rocks and soda together will make your stomach explode, end quote, for example, question mark. And the answer is reaction myth. Mm -hmm. But if you were to take the C in reaction and move it in front of the R at the very beginning, it becomes creation myth. Oh, okay. Okay. Smart. Fun. Classic Paolo. Classic. Uh, And then 39 across, potential Catherine Heigl sequel whose title replaces 27 with a hundred or 1,027, question mark. Uh, and the answer was octillion dresses. <laughs> and if you move the C, it becomes cotillion dresses. Wow. Amazing, right? Uh, and then 51 across, recording at Sotheby's, question mark. And the answer was auction tape. But if you move the C, it becomes caution tape. It was just very fun and then also from that puzzle this is for you 40 down attraction for blockheads question mark lego lego land baby i would love to go to lego land i would too yeah who's watching lego master this season just not me me, but not because i don't like it just i just doesn't i never get around to it yeah i mean 
It's good. We had we dropped the mass singer. We could only watch one like prime time or whatever. Mm. Like basic cable competition show. Mm. Mm-hmm. The year Lego. I mean, these people are just so talented with their Legos. The masked singer. I've always been wild. intrigued about. I, yeah, it's really. But I always had fun watching it. But it's just like such a long, a big commitment. Um, but it's very bizarre. It's like a, it kind of reminds me of like Eric Andre. I wish it was. I wish it was actually edited more, like Eric Andre. <laughs> but they don't do that because you just it's watch, on like ABC. You should just watch fan edits of the Mass Singer. I'm sure somebody's editing it like <laughs> Eric Andre. I do know it. Mass Singer, I think, originated in either I think potentially Japan. But <clears throat> it's definitely based off like yeah a different. I, th- I think it is a Japanese show. And I think it has that, it has that vibe. It does. Mm-hmm. Just a little bit. You're like, oh, interesting. Um, what else you got? Um, that's it. That's all I got. All right. I'm going to end us with another Palo puzzle from this week. Wednesday, November 30th, New Yorker, Palo Pasco. Uh, 15 across. I love this, but I, I, I'm dying. I should just ask him. I should write to him on Twitter and ask him. Um, 15 across. Very engaged with internet culture. What would you say for that? Um, I don't know. I mean, it was like chronically online. Like that's oh, like yeah. chronically online, right? But chronically mm-hmm. online is much longer than 15 letters. And the, so the answer is extremely online. And so mm-hmm. I want to ask him, like, did you want it to be chronically online? Because I feel like well, if you're chronically online, then you know that the answer there would be chronically online. I have seen that some there are some conversations that it's a misuse of the word chronically. Oh, my God. So, I, I know, you can't win here. <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to do whatever, like, offends the least amount of people. but. I- Oh, God. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. But um, moving on. 32 across makes a duck face. And the answer was pouts. thought that was cute. Nice um, 53 across. Exactly. Pads on cat's paws. Cute silly. Toe beans. Toe beans. beans. Toe beans, of course. And then 35 down. People might not want to drop them in polite company. And the answer is what? F-bombs, oh, which I have done because I, well, nothing I do is necessarily by accident. <laughs> She's from Joyzy, okay? She can't help it. <laughs> it just, it's, it's basically part of my vernacular at this point. And I feel like in my vernacular, the, the F word has become so innocuous. It doesn't, it's not even a curse word to me anymore. It's just mm-hmm. an, a word of emphasis. And then unfortunately, I meet people that never use that word. And then they're like you're a lot in big bold letters and i'm like sorry anyway that's me classic cheese and we love her for it (laughs) uh that's all i got well okay should we know what time it is yes it's that it's that time of night ladies and gentlemen all right i'm flipping the coin now It's heads. Ugh. All right. I guess I'll just put my feet up and relax <laughs> until it's my turn to shine. So my topic comes from the Wednesday, November 30th, New Yorker by Palo Pasco. 23 across. Color of a matador's cape. And the answer red. is red. Exactly. Talking about bullfighting today. Ooh. Yes. So I want to preface this with like, I obviously know that bullfighting is a thing. And I know, like, I've seen matadors and I know the whole, like, stereotype of, like, waving a red cape in front of a bull and they'll charge you and bulls hate the color red and, like, all this stuff. I had never, I knew probably 0% about bullfighting. Um, mm-hmm. And I learned, I learned a lot today. All right. Uh, I'll just tell you that. And then um, also just a little bit of a trigger warning for animal cruelty and gore okay so let's get into it on this beautiful thursday evening that's when we're recording today um so do you know anything about bullfighting have you seen a bullfight hopefully not but i haven't but in barcelona there's this old bullfighting ring that they've turned into a indoor mall oh um, and i've been there <laughs> and it is kind of cool they have some stuff up that mm. like shows you know pictures of what it used to look like mm-hmm. and interesting I have some more on Barcelona coming up. Yeah, I know. that's it's Bullfighting was huge there. But mm-hmm. even when I studied abroad there, 
they weren't they weren't doing it at that time. Correct. Probably. Yes. It, it had already been like Yes. I don't know if it was made illegal or what, but mm-hmm. they stopped doing it. Yeah. We'll get to I'll talk to you about mm-hmm. that specific city, well that specific region and bullfighting in just a bit. Uh let's hop into it. So, for the basics, I'm just going to like read you a like one line definition of bullfighting from Wikipedia just to kind of wet the palate. Uh, It is a physical contest that involves a bullfighter attempting to subdue, immobilize, or kill a bull, usually according to a set of rules, guidelines, or cultural expectations. So yes, part of bullfighting, even today, is often killing the animal. Mm -hmm. Um, And bullfighting varies greatly depending on the region or culture, but the most well-known form of bullfighting is Spanish-style bullfighting, which is practiced in Spain, Portugal, southern France, Mexico, Colombia, Ecuador, Venezuela, and Peru. The exact origin of bullfighting is lost to history. There are a couple theories, of course, and I'm only going to point out a couple of them. In a little place called, and I don't know how to pronounce this city, this Cretan city, uh, it's either Knossos or Knossos. Um, on the island of Crete, uh, they found these frescoes painted on, like, cave walls um, from ancient Manoa, which is circa 1500 BCE. And they depicted, these frescoes depicted games with bulls in which young people were shown grabbing the animal's horns and vaulting over them. Okay. Uh, and then there's a group of people called the Celta- Celtiberians, uh, and they resided on the Iberian Peninsula in the last ages of the BCE, uh, that they were aware of the wild cattle that inhibit, inhabited their forests, and they developed the hunt for these pieces, these cattle, uh, into a game. And they would herd these animals, and would use them f- as auxiliary war machines, uh, where uh, they would essentially take advantage of the ferocity of the the specific type of cattle found on the Iberian Peninsula. For example. Uh, These people uh, were defending a city that was being besieged by Hamilcar Barca, which is Hannibal's father. Uh, You probably Mm -hmm. all know Hannibal from, I don't know, Sparta and whatever. Um, So they were defending the city being besieged by Hannibal's father, and they gathered a great herd of wild horned bulls, harnessed them to wagons loaded with resinous woods lit with torches, and drove the herd at the enemy. Oh, that'll do it. That'll do it. So, but before they they drove them to the enemy, they used a sort of hunting game to capture the mm-hmm. bulls. Then we move into the 700 CE during the Islamic rule of the Iberian Peninsula, where bull lancing tournaments developed as a result of the rivalry between Islamic chieftains and Christian Iberian knights. Bull lancing is essentially groups of people riding horses in the streets with uh, while with like lances chasing mm-hmm. a bull to kill it. Uh, And major cities had amphitheaters for this particular type of entertainment, but smaller cities would hold these festivals in the city square or plaza. And these organized bullfighting or bull lancing festivals became commonplace by the end of the 11th century and continue to be popular today. And obviously the most famous of which is the Fiesta de San Fermin, during which the bulls are run through the city streets of uh, Pompolona. Mm -hmm. That's the running of the bulls, right? Um. And while none of these origin stories are verified as direct ancestors of contemporary bullfighting, it's likely that modern bullfighting came from a combination of influences, rituals, and cultures from this area and all of those time periods mentioned. And in case it wasn't obvious, we're talking about Spanish bullfighting today, okay? Mm-hmm. There's bullfighting all over the place. There's bullfighting is popular in India, for instance, or bull festivals. We're talking about Spain. So let's get into it. By the 15th century in Spain, bull lancing tournaments was a favorite sport of the aristocracy, uh, and you would probably see some form of bull tournament at every court function, which is kind of interesting to me. Bullfighting became so popular that the matches were eventually held during fiestas in commemoration of holy days and the canonization of saints. And even today, the opening day of the bullfighting season in some areas is Easter Sunday. Okay. Bullfighting is deeply cultural and deeply religious. And while Mm -hmm. we'll talk about the controversies of bullfighting, part of the reason why it's so hard to eradicate is because of the deep cultural and religious ties. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind in terms of like maintaining some form of sensitivities. Uh, You don't have to like bullfighting, though. Uh, So not only was it enjoyed by the aristocracy, but it was also performed by the aristocracy. 
um, as knowledge of the noble skills spread throughout their dom domains, they were invited to competitive jousts in provincial tournaments. So, like, these people would be, like, they'd be holding, like, tournaments in their, like, backyard and, like, ah, at their castle. And then people were like, wow, this duke is so good. Like, come out to this far provincial town and perform here. The caveat was that when they traveled, they weren't aware of the native stock of bull. And so they would, like, perform worse and essentially made their lackeys do most of the performing because it was dangerous and they didn't want to die. So they would make their lackeys do the performing. And because mm -hmm. of this, the lackeys who were usually, like, working class or some sort of like indentured servant of some sort uh it became more and more popular with the general public bullfighting and the aristocracy eventually was like oh you know they're enjoying it so we're not gonna enjoy it anymore we're done with this and so the aristocracy kind of like separated themselves with bullfighting but the general public was like fuck yeah we love bullfighting let's see so with bullfighting's popularity growing among the among the public Business folk realized that bull breeding was financially profitable, uh, and breeders began breeding herds uh, for specific characteristics. Uh, the most famous breed of bull, f bull for bullfighting is Spain's famous Spanish fighting bull, which is bred for its aggression and physique, and is raised free range with little human contact. Hmm. Okay, so now people can make money from breeding bulls. That meant they could also make money off of the actual bullfighters. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest, this is kind of where we're going to start getting into more of like graphic information about what happens at a bullfight. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just bear with me, my friends. Um, so one of the greatest early professional bullfighters was Joaquin Rodriguez Costaleres, born in Seville in 1729. Known as the father of modern foot-based bullfighting, he is credited with creating the pomp and pageantry associated with modern commercialized bullfighting including some of these things that he introduced include the basic cape pass so it's when they like wave the cape it's called a pass like when the bull runs past it's called a pass mm -hmm. so the very basic cape pass called the veronica in which a in which uh the cape is swung slowly away from the charging bull while the matador keeps his feet in the same position so he introduced that Mm -hmm. Then the he introduced the matadors tradition of wearing an elaborately embroidered costume. The costumes that matadors wear are insanely gorgeous. And mm -hmm. there's like superstition and like tradition that goes into like the donning of the costume and like certain types of things that you put on and when you wear it and when you don't wear it, who watches you put it on, all of this. Uh, mm -hmm. He also introduced the most common method of killing the bull, which is called the volipi, in which the bull is transfixed by the cape held low to the ground while the bullfighter lunges forward as the bull charges and with the right hand plunges the sword between the bull's shoulder blades. Thank and you. And that for... would kill a bull. We'll get to how and why okay. that would kill the bull. Uh, another famous bullfighter from the time, and apparently this other guy's rival, uh, was a man named Pedro, uh, Pedro Romero, who apparently killed 5,600 bulls during a 28-year career. Damn. Uh, yeah. And he popularized the use of the estoque, or estoque, which is a sword that is still used in bullfighting today. Um, and he also popularized the muleta, which is the name of the red cape. Mm -hmm. uh, da, 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 da. Uh, Romero was famous for ex executing a more dangerous, dramatic, and difficult method of killing. So there's two methods of killing the bull. There's the one we just talked about, the volape, where he goes between the blades of the, the the shoulder blades and this one is the more dangerous version it is called the recibiendo in which the matador stands still and receives a charging bull on the sword like this oh my gosh yeah uh, in these early bullfights the kill was the pivotal point of the spe spectacle and if the kill could be executed after only a few cape passes so much the better but over the years uh, the ma it's actually changed the matador's ability to work the bull to master the animal and to exhibit the graceful art dittorio began to be, like, appreciated just as much as, if not more than, the physical killing. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, bullfighting exploded with the, like, onset of, like, railways. Bullfighting rings were everywhere, like, everywhere mm -hmm. in Spain and France um, and, you know, uh, Central and South America. It was, at the time, obviously much more popular than football. 
soccer for the Americans mm-hmm. out there. Um, moving into the 21st century, bullfighting has since lost some of its popularity. The most popular spectator sport in Spain is now football, obviously. Uh, mm-hmm. Nevertheless, bullfighting still draws considerable crowds. In 1996, for example, some 40 million spectators ascended bullfighting, attended bullfighting uh, and bullfighting festivals. Uh, there was a record of 60, 650 fights in Spain in which some 3,900 bulls were killed. And the Spanish public spent $160 billion uh, Pesetas, pesetas, um, which is equivalent to 1.4 billion U.S. dollars, to watch bullfighting that year. Uh, and in that same year, bullfighting empo- employed 200,000 people, more than 1% of, like, the Spanish workforce, which is insane. Mm-hmm. And as I'm sure you've guessed it, there have been campaigns to ban the sport entirely. Uh, Catalonia actually banned bullfighting in July of 2010, becoming the first mainland Spanish region to ban the sport. The Canary Islands actually banned it before them, uh, but the ban was super significant because the region had a long bullfighting history. Barcelona is in Catalonia um, and was home at the time to three bullfighting rings. And so it was a big deal that they shut down the bullfighting industry. However, Mm -hmm. the ban was overturned by the Constitutional Court of Spain in October 2016. The ruling stated that Catalonia could regulate bullfighting and enact specific measures but could not outright ban the practice. They were like, oh, we just thought we lost a bunch of money doing this. Kind mm-hmm. of like, let's mm-hmm. go back and... Uh, certain states in Mexico have banned the sport. Uh, Mexico City banned it indefinitely in 2022, just this year. Oh, wow. Um, bullfighting is also banned in Argentina, Canada, Cuba, Denmark, Italy, and the UK. Those are the only countries that outright ban bullfighting. Mm-hmm. So, Costa Rica uh, prohibits the... Uh, killing of bulls however there are still other types of bullfights where like they rile the bull up and provoke it and poke it and do all this stuff in order to get the bull to charge you and then you have to run away but they don't kill it but they're still like battering this thing Mm -hmm. um in france in 1951 bullfighting was legalized in areas where there was a quote unbroken local tradition locations included in this exemption were nems arles alles bayonne among others uh, and in 2011, the French Ministry of Culture added bullfighting to the list of intangible heritage of France. Whatever that means. And of course, animal rights activists were like, what the hell? Like, how can this be like culture? Like, um, but the Administrative Appeals Court of Paris ruled uh, in the favor of the animal rights activists saying like, well, well we can't necessarily consider it culture. Um, but in a separate case, the Constitutional Council ruled on in September 2012 that bullfighting did not violate the French Constitution. So it's not banned there. Uh, and in the U.S., it is legal. Bullfighting is legal, but it mm. is frowned upon. I've never seen it. We've never seen it. It's not a cultural thing here, thankfully, yeah. but it's not banned. Uh, it was outlawed in California in 1957, but the law was amended in response to protests from a, a very large Portuguese community. Um, and so lawmakers are like, fine, you can have bullfighting as long as it's bloodless, meaning that, uh, you were allowed to bullfight, but you weren't allowed to draw blood. Um, yeah. And then Puerto Rico actually banned bullfighting in 1998 entirely, which is, Hmm. that's a thing. So obviously animal welfare is the question is like, what's the question here? Right. Yeah. Um, there's a guide to bullfighting called the bullet point bullfighting guide that, uh, warns spectators that bullfighting is not for the squeamish and that they should be prepared for blood. Some of the things you might see in a bullfight. Prolonged and profuse bleeding caused by horse-mounted lancers. So there are people on horses with lances that will like continuously jab and poke the, whore, the, the bull and it'll just be out in the ring bleeding all over the place as oh it's God. basically being run around. Uh, a bull, The bull may charge a blindfolded armored horse who is sometimes doped up so that as not to fear the charging bull. So, like, not only do the boars get gored, but the matadors could get gored, and also the other animals in the ring with yeah. the bull can be gored. Uh, oh, and then also, they I'll talk about this in just a second, but the placing of barbed darts into the back of the bull, um, and then, of course, the, mat- the matador's fatal sword thrust. The guide stresses that these procedures are a normal part of bullfighting and that death is rarely instantaneous and further warns those attending bullfights to be prepared to witness various failed attempts at killing the animal before it lies down entirely. 
Hmm. I don't know if that's for me. It's not for me either. So I'll talk to you about the performers. Performers, uh, like the professional bullfighters, are called terreros. And a terrero can have one of three specific jobs. The first is the picador, which is a mounted assistant with a pike who lances the bull in the bull's in the bullfight's first act. Mm -hmm. Then you have the bandoleros, the which are the assistants who are on foot, and they like execute the initial cape work to get the bull like riled up. And it's their job to place barbed darts into the bull's back in the second act. And then there's the matador who will work the bull and eventually kill it in the bullfight's final act. Uh, and matadors actually wear special costumes. We kind of talked about this. And the costume is called traje de luces or luces, it's a, which means suit of lights. And it's consisting of a short jacket, a waistcoat, knee-length skin-tight trousers of silk and satin, richly beaded and embroidered in gold, silver, or colored silk. And the dressing of a matador is a solemn ritual, one uh, like filled with tradition and superstition. It is considered an honor to be invited to the dressing of the matador, which usually occurs an hour or so before the late afternoon fights, because all bullfights happen late afternoon. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, I'm going to go quickly through each of the acts, and then I'm going to end, because... Okay. Well, so do you, in your, are you going to talk about, like, do matadors ever get killed? They do. Yeah. I'm not going to talk about that explicitly, but yes. So a matador, the way bullfights work, there are, I think, six fights per event. Mm -hmm. And each fight has three acts, and there's three matadors per event. Mm -hmm. So the lead matador will fight the first and fourth bull, and then... The second matador will fight the second and fifth bull, and so on and so forth. Okay. And if a matador is gored, he basically is tapped out, and the next matador goes in. Oh, damn. Yeah. And a lot of the reason why... The, so the in the first and second act, the matador is in the ring with his assistants, whether it's the picador or the, the bandoleros, mm -hmm. um, in order to like have multiple people in the ring with him to essentially violently like attack the bull to a point where when he is in the third final act he's so weak that the matador can be in the ring with him by himself and be yeah. safer it is yeah. still incredibly dangerous to be in the ring even with a wounded bull in mm -hmm. the third act but yes matadors do die no um but matadors make a lot of money like mm -hmm. a lot a lot of money which is one of the reasons why people still do it Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, let's start with the performance. There are three acts of a bullfight, like I've already said. Act one. So there's a ton of opening fanfare that happens with, like, people yeah. tra traipsing out, music being played. There's, like, the host of the, the, the bullfight, which is usually some local dignitary or the president or something. Mm -hmm. um, and they sit in the big box, and the matador comes out and dedicates the fight to a certain person or dedicates the bull to a certain person, whatever. Uh, after all of this is done, the bull is finally released into the ring. The bull, sadly, is usually kept in an enclosed dark pen all day ahead of the match. And when the pen is unlocked, the bull will run at full speed down the tunnel because it's the only point of light it can see. And it's been like kept in this mm -hmm. small dark pen. Okay. So he races out. Uh, and then a bull, so this is like a side note, like usually a bull will run out and be like ready to go. However, mm -hmm. There are certain bulls that might get switched out. If a bull runs to the entrance and suddenly stops upon entering the ring or attempts to escape back through the still open gate, it might mean that the uh, bull is, quote, tame or cowardly, whatever that means. Uh, and then it would get swapped out for a different bull. Mm -hmm. Because part of the art of bull lancing and bullfighting is understanding the stock from which the bull is bred. Mm -hmm. And understanding its behavioral tics. And if you have a bull that doesn't behave as it should, it's even more dangerous for the matador and his assistants to be in the ring with it. And what happens to that bull? Them, I assume they... It probably gets killed. Killed. Eventually, yeah. Because yeah. it was bred for this point, for this purpose, and it's not going to complete this purpose. Anyway, so it comes out. It's not a cowardly bull, so it's going to fight. The Bandolarios, how do I say this? Ban Banderillos 
and the matador exchange passes with the bull from one side of the ring to the other. And then the mounted picador, so the picador is on a horse, an armored blindfolded horse, enters and will test the bull's courage and lance the neck muscle to ensure that the bull's head hangs low enough for the matador to execute the kill later in the final bullfight. Oh, my God. Sorry, yet trigger warning. This is, um, yes. So then that brings us to act two. Both the picador and the matador will leave the arena, leaving just the bull and the bandoleros, which are, there's multiples, so they're not just there by themselves. Uh, and they will alternate in planting three pairs of dart-like sticks decorated with colored paper with a 1.2-inch barb at one end into the bull's shoulder at the junction of the neck. And all of this, they're doing this to weaken the bull. Pictures of the bull with the, the darts in the back, it's like sticking out really, it's really sad. Mm-hmm. It's really sad. So that's act two. And that brings us to act three. The final act, which involves just the matador, the matador alone. This act is essentially where the matador performs a series of close passes with the bull. The bull is now in a weakened state, and so his charges are weaker, which is why the matador can be there alone. But the excitement from the crowd is at its peak and only grows with every pass of the bull. Some matadors, before killing the bull, may demonstrate their complete mastery of the animal by executing an adorno, which is essentially an, ad- uh, an ornamentation or like a flourish that can range from turning one's back to the bull, kneeling confidently in front of the bull, kissing the bull's head, or even hanging a hat on the bull's horn. Hmm. <sighs> the killing of the bull is done either volape, which we talked about, which is kind of like... The bull comes and he goes into the side or mm-hmm. uh, recibiendo, which is straightforward. Uh, the actual moment of the kill is called Ora de Verdad, the moment of truth, where the bullfight will where the bullfighter will thrust forward uh, and sink the sword uh, into the small opening of the bull's shoulder blades at the junction of the neck. And a matador actually only has 10 minutes in the final act to complete the kill. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um if the bullfighter fails within this time, a trumpet warning is blown, uh, and then you're given, like, uh, you're essentially giving three avisos is what they're called, but, like, three more attempts to kill the bull. And if you can't kill them within those small allotted time periods, then you are you leave the ring and you're considered a disgrace of a matador. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after the bull is killed, the carcass is dragged from the arena, quartered, dressed. Sometimes the bull meat is given to the poor, but usually it's sold right at the plaza where the bull ring is. Uh, and then the ring is raked over. The next bull is introduced and the spectacle begins again. At least they're like using the meat. It's not totally for waste, but it's like you don't need to. Oh, it's hard because it's a cultural thing. It's incredibly cultural. But at the end of the day, I feel like they're abusing this poor animal. Yeah, I mean, they definitely are. <laughs> it's, like, horrifying. Yeah. I read somewhere that the stock that is bred in Spain, the Spanish fighting bull, mm-hmm. lives, like, twice as long as, like, your average, like, cattle that is used for and raised for, like, consumption. Mm-hmm. Like, uh biologically would live twice as long but it's the the bull that has the most like mortality or the highest mortality rate Mm -hmm. because of why it's bred yeah so well Well, (sighs) once again a little touch of animal cruelty it happens every once in a while and on our podcast and uh yeah i mean i learned a lot i really did i didn't realize how much technique goes into it I didn't yeah. realize how deep the cultural significance is to the point where, like, countries literally cannot ban it outright because it's mm-hmm. so culturally deep. But it still makes me really, really sad. The costumes are awesome, though. Unfortunately, yeah. the costumes are awesome. <laughs> Sadly, yes. Um, yeah, I don't think I'd, I'd see one. No. I can't even look at... I cut my finger. I, was, I pulled out some parchment paper, and I sliced my finger on that little part where you, you, you yeah. break the parchment paper. Blood, I was squeamish. I was like, You're I'm going to faint. I'm going to faint. So that's me. You're not going to see me at a bullfight. Certainly not. Well, all right. I guess we'll pivot over to my topic, <laughs> which is a slightly more uplifting. So. Oh, great. Let's, let's, let's move right along. Yeah. My topic comes from the Thursday, December 1st, New Yorker by Patrick Berry. 
17 across, parties with dancing and disguises. Costume party? Masquerade ball. <gasps> oh. I've That's always wanted to go to a masquerade ball. Do, 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 do. Have you been to a masquerade? I have not, sadly. Let's, but, let's host one. Yeah. We'll, we'll see if there's any in Chicago. Um, okay, so masquerade balls. What mm. do you usually associate with masquerade balls? Span with the opera? That's what I always mm-hmm. think of, the masquerade song. And um, Cinderella Story with mm-hmm. Hilary Duff. Even though it's like... Really? She she had like the tiniest mask on and she had very recognizable hair. Like you couldn't. And her recognize. voice is ex- yeah. like whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's the that's the caveat of these goddamn things. I'm like, could you really not recognize who this Just was? Just give her a bigger mask. I know. Like costume department. Well, you may also associate um Venice, Italy with yes. masquerades because if you've ever been to Venice, they have the little masks everywhere that you can buy. Everywhere. Um but masquerades didn't start in Italy. They just like to take credit for it. Okay. And while you may associate masquerades with like high society, like fancy parties, it started as a common village celebration. And okay. like I said, it wasn't in Italy. It was in France. Masquerade <laughs> sounds French, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a French word. But in the 14th and 15th centuries, there were a lot of village festivals or carnivals before Lent. So I didn't realize this, but the Latin word carne val or valet translate to farewell to meat so Ah. it's like you know in lent you're not supposed to eat meat so you would have like this carnival before lent and it was like a you know your last time to party and let loose before you got this really like strict period amazing um so villagers would gather in masks and costumes and take part in elaborate pageants and uh you know processions and then the French royalty was like, hmm, we want to have, like, cool parties like the commoners. Mm-hmm. So they started to throw masked events Typical. to honor, like, visiting royalty um, or to honor royalty and welcome mm. visiting royalty. So one of the biggest examples of this was in 1393, Charles VI of France held a burning men's ball to celebrate the betrothal of the queen's lady-in-waiting. So Ooh. this... He basically turned, like, the masked carnival, which was kind of like a daytime thing, into a nighttime soiree, including nocturnal frolicking, risk, and intrigue. Oh, my God. Um, So King Charles and five of his, like, little best friends dressed up like wild men of the woods, and they performed a dance on an outside dance floor that was covered in flaming torches. That's why it was called Burning Men's Ball. Cute. Any wrong move and, like, a dancer could go up in flames. But keep in mind, they were all in masks and wearing, like, the same costume. So there was no way to tell which one was the king Ooh. and which one was just, like, a regular person. So the queen is watching this happen and is like, oh, God, he better not, you know, He better keep burn. his shit together, yeah. Um, so that was in, like, the late 1300s. And then Italy didn't come into the pictures until the 1500s mm. when masked balls saw a rebirth in Venice during the Renaissance period. Mm. Um, so it was basically a way for Venetian aristocrats to enjoy secret desires mm. while remaining anonymous. Mm. These parties were filled with decadence, gluttony, and, you know, of course, sex. Fornication. Um, yeah, that's what that's like what most people associate with, uh, mm-hmm. you know, like the Venetian masks. It was from mm-hmm. this time period and it was like more of a high society type thing. But yeah, it was basically a way for them ah. to like party hard without ruining their reputation because everyone wore masks. Of course, of course. And then in 1797, the Venetian Republic fell and the masquerades fell with it. Lost forever. Or were they? (laughs) So, John James... You are on your bullshit today. (laughs) John James Hediger, a Swiss count, took a bunch of Venetian costumes with him to London. And then he started having, like, opera performances with these costumes. Supposedly King George II was in attendance. And then he branched out into hosting public parties in gardens around London, which included playing games with the masks, mostly involving guessing someone's identity. Ah. Then these types of parties became popular, but they had, like, a really bad reputation because it was basically, once again, a night for drinking and having sex. And, you know, then that was the time when colonial America was like spreading around Mm. and some people wanted to have these masquerades in america but then there were um people who opposed them so the original anti-maskers if you will (laughs) um there were anti-masquerade writers and they claimed the events encouraged immorality and foreign influence and yes 
Um, but of course, the British had to class things up a bit. So there were these like, you know, sex parties basically in public parks. Mm. But then some the finest halls in England started throwing masquerade parties, like more dignified versions instead of, you know, of all course. night dancing. They started to see waltzes and courteous exchanges. But these were still more fun than like your average ball because there was the element of anonymity. And there was often like some type of game where you, you know, guess people's identities, mm. essentially. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but it wasn't all fun and games because oh. over in Sweden in 1771, King Gustav III, he was not a fan of his own parliament and he despised their reform. So he seized power from his parliament. Um, and now he had like a bunch of enemies, but he still threw masquerade parties, which is risky because you don't know, you know, everyone who's at the party because they're wearing mm-hmm. masks. And at this one party that he threw, um, one of the masked party goers was well there was like a group of them who basically ambushed him and someone shot him at the <gasps> party in a mask and he didn't die at the party but he died like a few days or weeks later from an infection of the bullet wound <gasps> oh my god so then from this because of this masquerade balls were associated with like the ultimate night of risk and that kind of like vibe was depicted in numerous operas and plays yeah. at the time um there is an opera called gustav the third Oh um, but there's also Giuseppe Verdi's opera, A Masked Ball, <gasps> which it said, like, due to censorship, he had to pretend it was a fictitious story, and it's set in Boston <laughs> instead of Sweden. But, okay. Um, but yeah, so kind of, like, wow. had different reputations over time. Wow. Let's talk about some mask types. So okay. there's the bauta. That's the traditional Venetian mask. It's typically white and gold, and it only covers the upper half of the face hmm. so that you can still, you know, drink and eat and kiss freely of and course. both men and women would wear that smooches then there's the columbina these ones are more ornate and they have jewels and feathers there's the volto that's a full face mask and it's often Ooh. paired with a three-cornered hat so that's the one like if you really don't want people to know got who you are. it you better then, not have like a distinguishable gait yeah you know or like like a limp or something I feel like I wouldn't have a problem. At, like, if it was a masquerade full of people that I knew, I'd be like, I, I can't recognize your face yeah. anyway. Like, <laughs> this is fine for me. Exactly. Um, the Arlecchino, also known as the Harlequin, which we mentioned in, I mentioned in the mime episode, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a multicolored masquerade ball mask. And if you're wearing this, you're typically wearing like a multicolored patchwork clothing. So it's mm-hmm. kind of clown vibes. Clown vibes. That's clown probably core. what I... Yeah, what I would go for. Um, Then some people would wear plague doctor masks, which are those long beaked masks. There's pulchinella, which is a dark colored mask that has a really long nose that kind of looks like a beak um, and slanted eyes. It's like a dark brown mask. I think I know what you're talking about. If you saw it, you'd recognize it. And it's like very plain and it's traditionally worn with loose fitting black overalls. And then there's the Perot mask. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> There's the Perot mask, which I also talked about in the Mime episode. Right. That is a full coverage white mask and has, like, you know, that uh, classic, like, m- pantomime face on it. Mm. Um, but what about modern masquerade balls? Yeah. So these days, most modern masquerades are held in Venice, New Orleans for Mardi Gras, and Brazil. Like, Carnival has a mm. lot of masks. Mm-hmm. Um. Oftentimes, like the mask, or the dress code requires you to wear a mask that covers at least the upper portion of your face. And there's typically a theme to hide your identity, um, mix and mingle anonymously, and then, like at midnight, everyone takes their masks off and you know, <gasps> reveal the identity. Oh my god! So I literally, of- we would go, and I'd be like, "I'm not leaving your side." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like who knows who you'd be talking to. <laughs> Um, one of the most famous modern masquerade parties was thrown by Truman Capote in New York in 1966. It was called the Black and White Ball, and it was thrown in the Plaza Hotel in New York to honor Washington Post publisher Catherine Graham because throwing it for himself would have been seen as vulgar. Mm. So Catherine Graham, she was the first 20th century female publisher of a major American newspaper, and she was the one who presided over the Washington Post as it was reporting on Watergate scandal. So she was very uh, well known. Yep. But about the ball, she said, quote, Truman called me up that summer and said, I think you need cheering up and I'm going to give you a ball. I was sort of baffled. I felt a little bit like Truman was going to give the ball anyway and that I was part of the props. <laughs> so he basically just like <laughs> chose someone to throw this ball for. He like needed a reason for it. Hey, I don't blame exactly. him. 
Um, he decorated the ballroom with red tablecloths, and instead of flowers, the tables were covered with gold candelabras and white tapered Ooh. candles. The menu to be served at midnight consisted of, this is weird, scrambled eggs, sausages, biscuits, pastries, spaghetti and meatballs, and chicken hash. So oh, I'm thinking, like, that is, like, really good drunk people food, though. True, yeah. Although, I, I can't just have eggs like that in the middle of the night. It's like, um, you know, when you go, you're out drinking or, like, you finish, like, your play <laughs> and then you go to the the 24-hour diner yeah. and you, you have breakfast. Like, that's what that reminds me of. I think that the plaza was known for, like, the chicken hash or okay. and spaghetti meatballs. I don't know. There's some reason why he chose those. Okay. And then to drink, there were 450 bottles of champagne. So <gasps> specifically, Tattinger champagne. I don't know okay. what that means. But, yeah. So just champagne and breakfast food. She did a topic on champagne, by the way. I folks. did. Um, Capote purchased a black and white composition book and spent most of July sitting by a pool and compiling his guest list. He carried the book around with him everywhere for three months and he was constantly adding and deleting names. So some of the people who actually got invited were Catherine Graham, of course, mm. Lady Bird Johnson, of Andy course. Warhol, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, Gloria Vanderbilt, Harry Belafonte, Frank Sinatra, Mia Farrow, and the Italian princess Luciana Pignatelli. O-M-G. What? To be a fly on the wall of a party like that. I know. Um, The black and white ball was credited for an immediate upsurge in masquerade and costume parties. So people think that it could have been like, you know, also influenced just costume parties in general. Hmm. Um, It had been described as a pinnacle of New York social history. Wow. Six days after the ball on the December 4th episode of the television panel show, What's My Line?, panelist Arlene Francis wore the mask that she had worn at the party, transformed into a blindfold, because in that show, there's like a segment where people were blindfolded. Mm. So she had just been to this party. She's like, I'll bring my own blindfold. And it was a mask she had worn at the party. Oh. Oh, honestly, to be a fly on the wall. Yeah. So there were there have been a couple of re- recreations of this black and white ball. In 2009, Christie's Auction House, um, this is for charity, they recreated the ball at Rockefeller Center. The event followed Capote's dress code, schedule, and menu exactly, and the Peter Duchin Orchestra, which had played the original, played at this one. Oh my god. And then... TV chef Ina Garten <gasps> recreated a scaled down version of the event for a themed dinner party on her daytime cookery show, Barefoot Contessa. I am obsessed with her in a way that nobody will fully know. <laughs> she served the chicken hash, followed by French toast and truffles for dessert, in keeping with the black and white theme of Capote's party. Amazing. So here's some other i'm gonna end with um just talking about cultural references okay of masquerades please do um edgar Allan poe's short story the mask of the red death is oh. based at a masquerade ball in which a central figure turns out to be his costume and he's not wearing a mask at all oh my god the book musical and most film adaptations of the phantom of the opera has a <laughs> scene at a masked ball. Mm-hmm. The Phantom's costume is that of the Red Death from that Edgar Allan Poe story. Right, 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 right. Um, a ball in Zurich is featured in the novel Steppenwolf by Herman Hesse. Okay. In the play Romeo and Juliet, uh, Romeo meets Juliet at a masquerade ball. Right. The video game Dishonored has a mission called Lady Boyle's Last Party taking place at a masquerade when the primary objective is discerning the identity of Lady Boyle, a masked partygoer. This I've is- started playing Dishonored. I actually think it's something you would like, but okay, continue. All right, we'll, we'll discuss because mm. this comes up. This is like common in video games because in Assassin's Creed 2, there's a series of missions called Carnival set during the Venetian Carnival, where the primary objective is to gain access to one of the more prestigious masquerade balls, ending in the mission which primarily takes place in the masquerade ball. Ooh. And then the video game The Witcher 3, Wild Hunt, features a mission set at a masquerade ball on the Vegobud. Vegel Bud Estate, where the primary okay. objective is to find the owner's son who is wearing a panther mask. Oh. So. I love this. We sh- I want to go to a masquerade ball. We should suggest our work holiday party to be masquerade. But, like, for real. Like, you have to, like, cover your hair everything. You know... If you and I talk to Jen, I'm sure we could we could get we could twist some arms or Matthew. No one would 
agree to that, but it would be fun. It would be fun. You just got to work some magic. Mm-hmm. We'll see what we can do. We could just wear masks. That's our we costume. Are, we are wearing face masks, but That's we wear true. eye masks, too. <laughs> Balaclavas. Yeah. I got I got a couple. I got I got one. Um, wow. That makes me... Oh. Hearing things about, like, you know, the Plaza Hotel and Tribune Capote throwing this big party, like, I want... I don't want to be famous, mm-hmm. but I would love to run in a circle like that or like be famous adjacent to get invited mm-hmm. to something like that. Yeah. Well, we still got time, I guess. We certainly do. I mean, we can throw I can't our own be famous mind. because some people like have opinions about you. I don't want to be famous either. I just want to know I don't someone want to be who likes me. I want to know somebody who's famous, but also likes me, but not enough to like make me a staple in their life. So that I don't become too famous. But someone but who's enough like, to invite you to the masquerade. Exactly. That's fair. I think that's doable. We just have to find someone who we think will be famous. Yeah, I'm not asking. I'm really, I'm really, really not asking for much. No, I don't think so. Thank you. Um, listeners, are you famous? <laughs> Would you invite us to a masquerade ball? Um, if so, please let us know. You can find us on Twitter at the Good Eve Girls. Or Instagram at the Good Evening Girls. Or TikTok at the Good Eve Girls. Come on down, stick around. Um, always excited to hear from you. Uh, but until next time, please remember to keep curious out there. And we'll be back same time next week. Same Maybe. Place? I think. We have to- don't hold us to it. Do Look, not hold us to it. We don't know what's going on until like the new year because there's a lot of traveling involved. There's a lots of stuff going on yeah, at yeah, the end yeah. of the year. So. Um, we'll we'll keep you we'll keep you abreast of the situation. You will hear from us again. That you much will. I can, well, I can't one hundred percent promise you because it could be a nuclear war, but <laughs> like ninety nine percent sure. Ninety nine percent sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, until then, until that time, that inevitability <laughs> comes. We'll see you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Goodbye.